Ah. Hello. Hmm. Well. <laughs> Sally, Kim, I love it. Let's see who else. Anybody else over here? Uh oh. Demerits. Demerit yogis for not wearing your costumes. Well, that's okay. You're allowed to wear your everyday mask. I'm not sure if I can handle this the whole time. It's very hot. There's a lot of wool for Hawaii. We'll see. <laughs> Uh, wonderful to see you all. Take a look around. See who's joining us today. Oh, a little smaller group. People are out trick or treating, maybe. One more uh, week, Michelle and Stephen and Pari um, just finished the retreat over on Hollyhock in British Columbia. Um, so they're, everyone is on their way home one way or another, all the yogis, all the managers and teachers. So uh, I think it was a, a success after all. Um, so they'll be happy to see you all next weekend. Darine was going to try to make it today, but she got out of work late, so maybe she couldn't get her costume up ready either. Hmm. Okay. So finding your uh, seated posture. Letting your eyes come to close. And taking stock of all that is a flutter in the heart and mind, body, senses right now, in this moment. There's something about this time of Halloween, of the Days of the Dead, of this middle point between the equinox and the solstice. That's sacred and important to acknowledge in our hearts, our minds, and our lives. In this veil between the seen and the unseen, in the living and the dead. the reality, the fantasy, all of the masks that we wear externally and internally. In our meditation practice, we have this opportunity to invite all of it the... 
Invite the light and the shadow. The aspiration, the hopes, the fears, the gods and the goblins. the illuminated and the as yet to be illuminated. So we receive just this present moment of experience, anchoring in our common anchors, whether it's the stream of sound, receiving these sounds directly, the pleasant and the unpleasant and the neutral, our ideas and views and projections onto these sounds, distinguish from the sounds themselves. or we receive the body experience. In all of its formations and flavors. All this elemental phenomena of heat and coolness, pressure, lightness, hardness, softness. moisture and dryness, places that are familiar, experiences that are mysterious, unknown. Experiences in the body that make us feel confident, hopeful. Others that incline the mind toward fear, concern anxiety. Trusting that the mind and heart can receive them all with care, with clarity, and receive the fear with care, receive the confidence with care. Understanding the mind and conditions of body, their interweaving natures. We're settling into the area of the abdomen, the breath. As we go through this process of birth, life and death of each moment, the birth, life, and death of the breath, the sound, the moment of thinking or emotion, the memory, the fantasy. Narrowing the field of attention to whatever degree helps us feel like we can stay with the experience and the range that unfolds. And opening whenever that feels appropriate. Trusting that the heart can abide with all of the ghosts and demons and goblins and heroes. All of the projections, all of the reality. The 
the mind has the ability to care for all of it, understand all of it, and deepen in this caring, deepen in this understanding. not needing to make more of it than arises on its own. Be prepared for the unexpected. The mysterious, the unknown. to greet it, enthusiasm, care, interest, as best we can.
wonderful to sit with you all. Oh, Julia, you have a costume too. I like your swimming outfit. <laughs> Maybe if you're practicing the water casino, it would be good to have goggles if you ever were in the jhana realms of everything with water. I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> hmm. Mark, is that a costume or is that? Yeah. Ooh, your skull cap. I love that. Right on. Very cool. <laughs> uh, hmm. Yeah, so I just, you know, um, I do think that Halloween is wonderful. And I, I think there's something about our practice um, that to me feels very much in accord with some of the spirit of it, you know, I mean, I, I don't know all of the history of, you know, Samhain and, the, you know, I mean, I, I know there are many threads to understanding um, various cultures relationship to why this time of year might be a time where we reflect on either the dead um, or the unseen or that which is fearful that which is mysterious or unknown. But I think in the context we're in right now, that there is just this acknowledgement that I do believe is so important to recognize that, that we are afraid, you know, that we are afraid of ghouls and ghosts and goblins and, and of death and of the mysterious sort of invisible forces in the world that, we may wonder if they're at play or not in our lives, or even if we don't believe in them. Uh, this, these practices of being scared and of scaring ourselves and, and having there be a time where it's um, more socially permissible to, to invoke fear <laughs> in a playful way with one another. And, that it, and that, there, that it has to be playful in order for us to be able to I think really integrate the message of it, you know, to to understand that there is play involved and and the lightheartedness and the 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 joking quality of it I think allows entry into the gravity of it and the seriousness and and um, the ability to go into fear and explore it and and be interested in fear, be interested in the unknown in, in ways that we might not always uh, be willing to because the bleakness of it and the ghoulishness of it and the evil is real, right? We do have a sense of evil in, in the world, in our, in our own hearts and minds, and it's something that we know to be afraid of. We know that it is fearful, um, and rightfully so. And so um, to be able to have a relationship with these uh, costumes and dress and stories of of ghosts and ghouls, um, it's something very important, I think, for the heart to start to be able to perhaps integrate that internally, right? That that there is a process of that externally, but that it is ultimately um, about this looking at our own hearts and minds and bodies and, and looking at the parts of the mind and the heart that, that we're afraid of that, that scare us, whether they're... Um, uh -huh like impulses that scare us or memories that scare us or simply things that are so unfamiliar or that are so um, disruptive to the standard way in which we are holding who we are and we hold the world um, that we start to be able to develop a relationship with them is, is of um, extreme importance in our practice, right? That it's on one hand, of course, we're trying to cultivate the good and cultivate generosity and cultivate loving kindness and patience and all of these beautiful qualities. Um, but Buddha said in many places, you know, that, that, that it's not just a matter of avoiding all of the rest, that actually we need to be able to understand fear and anger and hatred and violence and cruelty 
um, and even the sort of more ghastly parts of ourselves in order to be free, right? Because it's, it's, a, it's an inner reckoning, it's an inner understanding of what are these tendencies rooted in? What are they, in what ways have they come to serve the mind and, and feel like they are protective qualities for a certain kind of stability, a certain kind of strength um, that may be rooted in delusion or greed or hatred and things that are very vile, but that ultimately we have to come to understand them with patience, with compassion, um, if they're going to untangle, right? That just avoiding them or just denying them or just trying to supersede them isn't ever going to really um, help us understand them. Of course, we need to do that from a place that is strong, that a place that is uh, strong with mindfulness or strong with loving kindness, or in the case of Halloween, strong with humor and some levity, right? The sense of that, that we can approach these things when there is a sense of fun, and when there is a sense of playfulness involved, that, that they're not only are they not as threatening, but there's like an invitation there to grow and to understand and to learn. And can we ever have that internally? You know, that's not something the Buddha spoke of very much, was like a sense of humor. Um, though there's moments where you sort of see him being a little kind of like sarcastic with folks, it seems like. Uh, but a, a sense of levity, a sense of um, playfulness with even these inner demons, um, I think that, you know, our team would all say is, is essential and, and, and um, really valuable in terms of the, the process of coming to understand these parts of our own hearts and minds that are so hard to be in relationship with. And of course, they help us understand others, right? That, that we then, if we really understand our own greed, we understand our own aversion, tendency towards cruelty, um, tendency towards ignorance, then when we see it in the world around us, it's not, it's not to say that we don't judge in a healthy way, that there isn't a discernment of saying, well, that's immoral or that's unethical. Um, you know, of course, that's still important. Even, for, you know, the Buddha did that all the time. It was very clear and sort of discerning right from wrong, ethical and from unethical, a kusala from kusala. But the difference is, if it comes from a place of understanding, right, of understanding like, oh, that is an unhealthy behavior that I understand because I can relate to it because I have been that greedy or I've been that consumed with anger or um, that unwilling to look at the repercussions of my actions and the impact that they might have on others, that that is a very different relationship then that we have with the world around us and that it's actually very important to, to understand that these are the inner purification of the process is completely tied in and related to the purification with our relationship with others. And where are we just angry at other people's anger or greed or hatred or illusion? Where are we afraid of it? Where do we want more of it for ourselves? What have you. Um, and where do we um, have a very different relationship? to greed, hatred, and delusion internally or externally because we've really come to understand it, how important that is. The other side of it is the, the side of wearing a mask and wearing a costume and embodying um, in a playful way energies, personality, qualities, tendencies that might not be ones that we identify with consciously, but that we have some desire to, some longing for, or some kind of playful um, relationship with this understanding of how constructed an identity we tend to live in um, externally and internally right that that of course we know that on some level there we always have a mask on in front of us when we're engaging the world and we're engaging whether it's strangers or people we care about there's some 
degree of performance there most of the time, if not all of the time. Um, and of course, there's a range of, of what that looks like in terms of how we're trying to present ourselves consciously or how we might be doing it unconsciously. Um, but this sense of, of recognizing that that is a volitional action, that there is some responsibility we take for how we present to the world, and that that is not fixed, it is not solid, it doesn't have to be, it's based on conditions, it's based on preferences internally that we have. And, um, and what is it like? It's sort of like a Mardi Gras time, you know, on the other side of the season, of what is it like to, to have a mask that allows us to um, explore and experience other aspects of personality and the dynamics of that? In what ways can that actually help us um, break down some of the solidity of what we think of in terms of personality view? Of course, the, there's also just like the inner masks that we wear, the um, even to ourselves. And that is much harder to see, but is an essential part of our practice, this quality of, of a personality and a view and an opinion that we're always reinforcing internally, or very frequently reinforcing internally, of, of preference, of internal, of who we are, whether we like it or whether we don't like it, whether we're judging our thoughts or whether we're judging our impulses, whether we're um, looking at them uh, without any discernment, whether we're even seeing the, the veil through which um, these internal actions of mind take place. Um, it's so important to really see the masks that we're wearing internally. And part of the practice is starting to let go of some of that way that we're constructing ourselves internally, always. The sense of me, 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 and mine, mine, mine. And, you know, my thoughts, my dreams, my plans, my mistakes my regrets, um, and all of that stuff that we're in the soup of, you know, in our meditation practice when we're formally in it. And then where are the places where we start to observe the mind that are beyond those familiar things? Where do we start to see that the mind is like constantly picking up threads that are familiar and that there's actually a lot of other activity of the mind that we might not notice as much that's sort of in the shadows or more subliminal and and weirder and, and less coherent and perhaps less enforcing of that sense of who we are. Perhaps in ways that are scary, perhaps in ways that show a sense of possibility as well. But important, the sense of wearing a mask and taking off the mask and seeing through the mask, whether that's a external sort of projection or the way much more subtly and much more profoundly really is the internal projection of ourselves. And what is it like to be playful with that and to explore the edges and what's behind and what's beyond the kind of formula that we tend to live in internally? We start to see how, like, um, how much you can't trust the mind at all in so much of our processes. I'm, I'm reluctant to talk about this, but I, uh, in the name of masks and, and these things, it seemed appropriate. I saw so I. I've become someone who will occasionally now jog. Uh, I, I, for my whole life, I've been like incredibly averse to athleticism of any kind, mostly because of the sort of culture that I always encounter around it of kind of like everything many of us may have some experience of, right? Uh, and it's, I'm at a point in my life where I have to. It's just, I have to do things. It has to be done, right? I have to be healthy in that particular. And so I've taken this sort of one way of doing it. And for, for me to be in public in that way is like, a, it's like, I can't tell you how mind melting it is. It's just like, I don't, like when you see those people who do that, right? Who jog and they have like, they're like things and they're like out there on the street and they're in public and doing this. It's just like, it's such a, um, it always seems so 
I, I always have my trip around it externally, right? And so the thought that I would see myself doing this and that I would like a throw a tomato at myself on the street, you know, for, for being one of these people. But there is something that I have really seen that's, you know, I try to make the most of it in terms of like, if I have to do this kind of stuff, uh, you know, I'll practice as much as I can. And to see how hard it is to practice and also try to do, right? So much of what's beautiful about the sitting posture is like you're, you're observing. And of course, there's still a lot of doing in the mind. Um, but it's something that the volitional action is a little bit less intentional. Uh, it's less, it's less in integrated into the practice. It's more just pure observation of those impulses with the walking meditation or uh, you know, daily life meditation, of course, there is this sense of observing the gestures, observing the intentional thing, but then sort of doing it around more intensive physical activity. I, it, the, the, the sort of like the, what's the word, you know, the, the conditional quality of the mind of like, if I'm starting to like jog up a hill, this sense of like, oh, like, I'm never gonna, like, I'm gonna, by the time I'm gonna, I'll make it to the top and then I'm just going to stop like this. I can't make it any further is like this notion, right? And then I get to the top and it flattens out and it's like, oh, okay. I can sort of like keep falling forward and not hit the ground for a while longer, right? And then it's like, uh, then you start, start to go downhill or a, little, like a slight decline, right? And there's this sense of like, oh, I could do this for an hour, you know? And this all happens within a minute right? This sense of this is impossible to I could do this forever to I can manage this. And it's something, of course, is very familiar to any yogi, right? Of like you're sitting there on the cushion and from one second to the next, you have a totally different perspective on what's possible in the next moment. You, you totally think you are the most like amazing yogi that's ever been and you can sit through anything. And then the next moment, you just like cannot bear something that you don't, can't even tell what it is. But there's just an energy, there's an anxiety, there's something um, uh, that feels totally unbearable, whether it's a genuine physical pain, uh, something hard to be with, or something that's um, more nebulous. And this, this amazing aspect of the mind and of the mask that we wear, the sense of certainty, of perspective, of view, of this is impossible, I cannot do this any longer, or I could do this forever, and the sort of me quality of that, and how not, it's totally fiction. Neither perspective is real, neither, nor a perspective in between. It's all just profound conditioning of the mind. And that the way in which we can start to observe this in our meditation practice of seeing that it's like, oh, it's all a mask. <laughs> is there such thing as the thinking without a me, right? Of, uh, a, a, you know, views without a self, view without some sort of sense of deep, conditioned fabrication around it. It's always worth looking at. And so I think the last thing I'll offer is just this this reminder of uh, of course we're afraid of the unknown. Of course we're afraid of death. Of course we're afraid of uh, threats that are material and threats that are spiritual or in the unseen realm. And it's, you know, the story of how the Buddha came to offer the loving kindness practice to this particular group of uh, monks who had gone into the forest to practice. Uh, I'm sure you know, many of you will know this story, but that, you know, they went into the forest to practice um, and by moving into this area and staying a little bit longer than your traditional wanderers, some of the spirits of that area got upset and were not that excited to have like this whole community of 500 people move into their forest. And so they started making all these like scary noises at night and terrible smells and um, trying to frighten these monks away. And it really worked. Like these monks were just terrified and they went to the Buddha and were like, we can't be here. It's like, it's there's spirits and there's ghouls and there's goblins and we have to go somewhere else. And the Buddha's like, no, just go back. And they're like, we can't, <laughs> we really can't. Like we're really, really super scared. And so is why he instructed the loving kindness practice. It's like to go back and to remember this, remember 
these words, remember this practice as this twofold thing, right? And to remember that this is how it's held. It's like to offer it to the spirits, to offer it to the unseen beings around us, to let them know that we mean no harm, that we are, our intentions are kindness and caring and um, that we wish them well and that we want to be good neighbors and stewards to their forest and um, good members of their community, really, right? Of the broader community that we find ourselves in. And that sense of caring reassurance um, and that it is said that the, the spirits are very susceptible to that and, and were very, their, their anxiety was alleviated and their sense of safety was granted, right, by these, these mendicants who wanted to live in the forest. And so there was that external aspect of it that was the dynamic. Um, but also in, to remember that it's also the internal purification of heart that is the, the more immediate goal of the practice, which is the, the, the ability to find care for all beings seen or unseen, cruel or gentle, uh, large or small, in whatever direction, in whatever realm, this sense that the heart has the ability to find care um, in this sense externally, right? But that the purification is always happening in the heart and mind, right? That it actually isn't limited by space or time or actual beings being there or not, but this sense of that the heart's ability to find more and more space and more and more tenderness and compassion and um, loving kindness right toward all beings and towards all and then when we say beings it's like well towards all manifestations of of fear or of anger or of craving or of greed of um, these you know powerful forces in the world and that our hearts have the ability to come to peace and to come to care for all of it um, is just, it's so important. Um, and so I wanted to just end with, uh, oops, I'm going to switch thing. Hold on. Not that one. With the Karniya Metta Sutta, um, which are the words that the Buddha is said to have offered. And um, I'll read it in English here and then maybe I'll chant it in Pali. I think I've done the Hawaiian um, another time. So this is apparently what the Buddha said to these monks when they were feeling overwhelmed with the ghouls and goblins and ghosts in the forest. Here, is what is worth doing by one skilled in what is truly meaningful. Having glimpsed the place of peace, they should be capable, honest, and very upright, easy to speak to, gentle, and not thinking themselves above others. Contented and easy to support, not too busy and living lightly, tranquil in seeing and sensing and wise, not too forward nor greedy for patron. And one should not do the slightest thing with which other wise ones may find fault, wishing may all have ease and safety, may all beings be in a state of peace. Whatever living creatures there are, without exception, trembling or steady, long, huge or middle-sized, short, tiny or massive, whether seen or unseen, and whether living far or near, whether in existence or coming into being, may all beings be in a state of ease. Let no one deceive another or think themselves above anyone anywhere. Let no one wish suffering for another out of resentment or hateful thoughts. Just as a mother would protect her own child her only child, with her life. One should cultivate such a state of mind toward all beings without limit, and toward all the universe. One should cultivate a state of mind of goodwill without limit, above, below, and all around, unobstructed, purified from enmity and hatred. 
whether standing, moving, sitting, or lying. For as long as one is yet to fall asleep, one should be steadfast in this attentiveness. This is said to be divine abiding here and now, not fixed on a view with virtuous conduct, perfected through clarity of vision, training away the greed for pleasures. One goes no more toward being conceived than born. And I'll chant it here in Pali just because it's always nice to remember some sense of the words that the Buddha himself spoke and one of the qualities of heart that come through in this particular version of it. Karaniyam Nata kusalena yantam santam badam abhisamicha sako jucha sujucha suacho chasa mudu anatimani santu sako cha subaro cha apaki cho cha salaukauti Santindriyo cha nipako cha apanga boku le su ananugino Nacha kudam samachare kinchi jena winyu pare upawa meyu Sukino wa kemi no hontu sabe sata bawantu sukitata Yehe kechi panabu tati Tasawa tawarawa anawa sesa Dingawa jehe mantahawa Najima rasakanukatuna Titawa jehe wa dita Jewa nure wa santi yawinure Itawa samawe siwa sabe sata bawantu suketata na paro parang niku beta na timanyeta kata chinang kanchi yaro sana atinga sanya na nyamanya sanuka Mata yata niyam putam, aisa e kaputam manurake. E wamping sababu tesu, mana sambawa ye aparimana. Metancha sabalo kasmi, mana sambawa ye aparimana. Udamma docha tiriyancha asambadamma veram masapatam Itancharam nisinova sayano yavatasa vengatamino Itam sati maditaya brahman etam viharam midamahu Tichincha anupagama silava dasane na sampano kamesu uneyange da nahi jatu gabasaye punare titi. All right, so we have some time for questions. If anyone has any questions about your practice, uh, about uh, instructions, talk, um, anything that would be supportive right now for you. Yeah, you can do like this, raise your little hand on the, you click the reactions button at the bottom and uh, raise your hand. Let me see, yeah, okay. Julia, here, you can unmute. Happy Halloween. <laughs> um. So, one is thank you so much for your beautiful chanting. 
I looked on the website and and you're chanting that on the audio section and I tried a few times to chant it with you. It's really lovely. Um, um, so I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm wondering if from this lineage in particular or the Sagang region of of the the hills in in Burma, are there any um, like cool death stories about enlightened monks or anything since it's Halloween? I mean, no pressure, but yeah. Yeah, you know, I think um, there are a couple and it's unfortunate, you know, one of these little projects that we wanted to do with the Metadonna project is at some point there was someone who went around um, a Burmese guy who went around the Sagang Hills at some point well, before my time, but when Steve and Michelle and, um, at some point went around and collected a, a bunch of stories from the Sagang Hills in terms of um, all kinds of basically very, a lot of them very kind of like supernatural stories. Um, and, uh, and so there's like a very rough translation of it and it's in like sort of like some of it's like in compute, like some old floppy disk and some of it's in like hardcover, hard copies. And so we haven't gotten around to actually like, you know, kind of doing a better translation and then getting it out there. Cause there's some really fun and uh, powerful things in terms of what I can remember. Um, there's, there was actually a, a friend of ours who comes here sometimes, or, uh, um, Hanuman, he, he came to, to Chazo once and um, spent some time going around actually also interviewing folks with different uh, stories. Um, and he was interested in sounds and were there any sounds that people, you know, what, did they, what makes them think of the Sagang Hills and what are the sort of most evocative things? And um, he went to some old monk who was like deep in some canyon and he said, was there, is there any sounds that you hear? What was he asked exactly? that are special to this place or something, you know? And he said, yeah, he was like, you know, sometimes on certain nights, I'll hear a big festival happening down in the valley where there's no longer a village. Um, but I'll, I'll, you know, it's, it'll be some, some certain times of the year that he'll, he'll always hear um, these sounds. And he's like, is that what you meant? And I think he didn't mean something quite so extraordinary, you know? Uh, but this, this sense that like there were, there, you know, that, that people tune in with the divine ear uh, to sounds from past and future. There are quite a few monks and nuns who are buried and entombed in the Sagang Hills with different stories. You know, some who are, you know, supposed to be arhats and um, their bodies like don't decompose is is the how it's framed. And so there's there's a a monk not too far from where we are sort of down in one of these valleys and you can go to the temple and you can see his supposedly preserved body there um, with the nails still growing and the hair still growing and the ears still growing and, and you know this is you know probably nearly 100 years since he passed away or, or what have you and it's very much considered like a you know, like a miraculous, you know, that people would go and visit and pay respects. And that place has a little bit of a kind of a weird energy, you know, there, there are also a lot of stories of folks who practice at the edges of the Dhamma, <laughs> you know, who are like, get into sort of like some of the more like psychic power stuff and less some of the wisdom stuff. And sometimes there's like a little bit of a weird energy with those. And definitely there's a whole still very vibrant animistic tradition heritage in different communities throughout Burma, of course, but even in the kind of Burmese ethnic um, kind of mainstream society. Um, so there's a lot of like sorcery and stuff like that. And those folks have like their own um, sort of stories of, of like mystical powers and that range of sort of wholesome or unwholesome. Um, you know, the folks, I've told this story before, but, the, you know, some of the people who um, have come to Chazo in the last couple of years with the smaller groups, we were able to bring them to 
the tomb, the tomb of um, the Myatan Sayadaw, the Happy Sayadaw, who, you know, we've all told stories about. I know, you know, Michelle has told a bunch of stories about, but Steve also, um, he was just such a wonderful, incredible being. And, and in, in, in many of the Burmese monastic traditions, the, the monks, much more than the nuns, often will kind of hold themselves like very distant. Like there's just this like, they're very, they can be very sort of withdrawn. Um, and to some Westerners, that can be very kind of off-putting, the sense of you're wanting more of a connection, you're wanting more of the sort of like sense of the like love and the love, you know, or whatever. And in, in, in that, lineage there's a very deep respect of that sort of coolness and sort of like pulled back quality to the mind and to these folks and so you give them something and there's not like a big thanks or a big like emotive expressive thing it's a sort of like you know acknowledgement of being given something but not trying to generate a lot of extra karma and so not that he did but the the happy side was really different in terms of a lot of that and, and was much more engaged and much more sort of energetically engaging and um, could also get like super quiet and kind of pull back, but then like be very um, connected. You know, he wasn't afraid of making physical contact either. Whereas you'll see a lot of monks in particular, again, less so than nuns, who are much more sort of just reserved around physical touching anyone, never not just people of the opposite sex, but really just anyone. There's a sort of like boundedness, and that sense of you having that protection when you need it can be helpful. But then when you don't need it, that it's unnecessary, and you just have this sense that he didn't need it, <laughs> that he was just he just wasn't clinging, and so he didn't care about touching, or he didn't he didn't need to be pulled back because. He wasn't attached, you know. Um, and so anyway, when he passed away a few, I keep saying a few years ago, but at this point it's probably been a while, six or seven years, um, they, we never knew what happened to his body, you know. People tend to do different things, but anyway, a few years ago, upon visiting, we were invited to go up to his his tomb and they opened it and had no idea but that <laughs> that he was buried inside in a glass coffin and um, and this was the sort of opposite of that other version of like the sort of in my view you know mystical supernatural sort of thing it was like very natural and that was the point you know it's like you go in and you can smell the decomposition right and you can see of his rotting corpse now this was of course maybe four years after he died so it, it was very skeletal it wasn't like really recognizing you know the features and it wasn't as probably disgusting as it would have been at various stages before that but it's strong and there were still bugs and there's still moisture and it was still like seeing the skeleton of someone you knew and loved and respected so profoundly there um, and still fleshy for sure you know and um, how it's such it's considered such an important practice right I mean it's in there are all these esoteric practices that are in like the sort of nooks and crannies of the tradition but you know observation of the cadaver and, and of, of uh, charnel grounds is in the Satipatthana Sutta you know it's right there and in, in mindfulness of body so it's not hidden, it's not some sort of like extreme out there thing. It's considered very much a part of it and, and how many of us have the chance um, to really do that in a way that's wholesome and healthy and not, you know, because we're in a tragedy or a war-torn area or something like that. Um, but to have this sort of body be the object of contemplation, um, to me it's such it's such a profound sort of final offering of his to us, you know, his students and people who appreciated so much about his sort of levity and lightness and clarity and reminding, as he did in his lifetime, of like the, that reflection on death and reflection of, you know, decomposition and the visceral and just mundane, non-magical, non-mystical, <laughs> non-mysterious reality of like all of this and what's inevitable is 
this at the heart of like our, the liberatory practice that we're involved in. Um, it's so powerful. It continues to be so powerful, you know. And so I've, the last few years, I've been able to go back, and I think you know some folks who are here at this Zoom have you know been able to see him and saw that, and in fact, saw I think maybe he did. So it's like yeah, really, um, really powerful, more than a ghost story. Um, but there are. I, you know who will know, Steve. I'm going to ask. So th th it's a good idea, Julian. I'll, I'll see if, you know, Steve or even maybe Jake might have a little bit of a sense of some of these other stories from the Sagan Hills because there's like tons and tons and tons and tons of them. And, um, you know, I sort of have certain ones in my head, but it'll be fun to, to, to look for a few more. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. Can you unmute? Yeah. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi. I, I just came in because these things are wearing things uh, and an hour late. But anyway, I still have a question. Um, so, uh, and practice these days, I really feel this need to reach a kind of tipping point. And I feel it like something very necessary, something that I want to reach. And obviously, <laughs> and, and, and in my mind, it's, it, it can happen only uh, by practicing more and having, um, spending more time in retreats and whatever. And I was wondering, I don't know if you, have some um, idea about this feeling, um, this kind of motivation that's happening uh, to me these days. Ah, yeah. I mean, I just, it's, it's so beautiful and it's, and it's, it's tricky. <laughs> I mean, You, it's like we'll never get free without some version of that. You know, that like this, this some Vegas, the spiritual urgency um, is it really is essential, you know, and I think we may go through periods of time where it's more visceral in our lives and in other periods of time. But I think the, the much greater challenge would be to not have that, you know? And so it's like, just that sense of like really understanding how important it is and how you have to have that if you're gonna be willing to go through all of the dukkha that you go through as a yogi, right? Which you've been doing, especially like recently, or as you've been going on a lot of retreats, it's like, to put up with it and to go through all of the physical discomfort and all of the mental discomfort and emotional, it's like, you know, that like you really, if you don't have a sense of spiritual ambition and a goal and the sense of really wanting to be free and really wanting to understand, um, it's very hard to put up with it. It's very hard to sort of find the motivation to do it. And traditionally, it's considered a wholesome, you know, chanda is just not the same as craving, right? It's, it's just, it's put in a different category where it's considered like that, that wholesome wanting, wholesome determination. Um, and so like where, you know, our lineage comes from, there is like, there was never a sense of it being a problem as far as in my experience, right? With like, some of the sayadas. Okay, and I do think that I have a sense, and I would say, hey, you know, you know, Michelle and Steven and Pari and Darine and Jake and you know, all of us who are sort of part of this world would would see that there there can be a downside to it. You know, that like that actually the fire of that can start to be destructive and can start to be can be unwholesome. It can lead to at times a over fervent, overly fiery thing where 
we lose track of also the need for patience and the need for you can't control this process just like you're saying right it's like you know that you no matter how much ambition you have and how much fire you have you know it's like it's not up to you when it unfolds and how it unfolds and so it's like it needs to be so extremely um balanced with the really i mean i think the most important thing is always going to be insight and 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 it's like that willingness to see the motivation and to see is it painful or is it you know pleasant is it neutral is it coming out of a wholesome thing is it coming out of aversion so that would be the thing to also to see it's like do we just hate the mind so much that we want to get out of it do we just hate life so much that we feel like we need to like break through and it's like that's understandable when that is the case for sure at different times in our lives but we can also see that there is something there that's really aversion right that's motivating it that it's like oh we can't it's like we can't stand the way things are and so we're grabbing on to a, a fantasy of what it might be even if we don't really know what that experience is the sense of freedom from it or maybe a past experience of freedom right that we're kind of clinging on to so I think there is a way in which it can be part of our sort of similar craving and aversion tendencies. And then it's just always important to be careful with it, but also just to notice, you know, it's like, you don't even have to maybe do anything so much as just like, see it. It's like, oh, this feels like wholesome. And this feels like healthy ambition, spiritual ambition. Or there's times where you're like, huh, is this really just wanting? Or is there a painfulness in the heart that it's avoiding something? Because that is ultimately the kind of tricky and the doorway is often wanting. If we, if, if enlightenment is the object of our wanting, is keeping us from feeling the wanting and the pain of the wanting, then it is a problem. And it's always going to be about letting go of the object, whatever it is, and feeling the wanting and feeling the tension in the heart. That's going to ultimately be the way, you know, to greater depth and, and to greater awakening. But it's very hard, especially when the object is something that's so sacred and so holy that we always, it's hard to remember that that object can also be a delusion. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know if that's helpful at all. I don't know what do you, but it's, but I think the sense of like, don't, don't feel like you need to get rid of it. It's so good to have that fire. And yes, there's times where it's like, it can it can get us into trouble. I don't know if you found that. I mean, have you found that it's sort of like gotten you more tight or more sort of tense or anxious at times? Um, from now, no. Mm. Um, I just think that, um, yeah, as you said, I'm trying to <laughs> to observe what's happening. But the thing that makes me a little bit, um, you know. Um, doubtful is, the, is the, the the idea that i have to reach something like the tipping point thing like you know that's the only thing that that that's make me makes me run wondering what it is exactly yeah no i think it's it's just good to wonder and you don't need to do anything more than that i do i think that you're right that this sense that we need to bring the mind to crisis in order to break through right there's like the sense of a tipping point that sometimes there is this sense of like you know like the buddha at some point <laughs> he was like i'm just gonna sit here until i get fully enlightened and like i'm gonna show up for this the armies of mara and like this like kind of last great battle you know of all of these forces and so there's something of like a heroic journey in that that is important and it's like an important like part of the mythology that's like internally we can relate to right you can have that sense of like oh we need to we need to like confront it all in a in a pivotal moment in a pivotal battle you know with these forces and so that is in the tradition and i think it's just always important to recognize that like the by the time buddha got there by the by the time he decided he was ready for that he was so ready. <laughs> I mean, he really was so perfected in all of these 
abilities of the mind and his concentration and his mindfulness and his compassion and all of these things. And so that's the other part of the story, which is like, if we're going to bring the mind to crisis of like, we're going to confront this extreme pain in the body or this extreme pain in the heart, we have to know that if the mind isn't actually ready for it, if we don't have the mindfulness or the patience or the tenderness or the all of the you know factors everything you can think of if they're not really there then we're going to end up hurting ourselves because we're going to end up being the the victims of our own the imperfections of the mind and the imperfections of our actions right and mental act, practice actions and so we'll pay the price for that you know and so it's always a matter of like are we willing to pay the price and see oh this was too much like this this hurt actually this I overrode something in the mind. I I did I ignored something that was important. I didn't listen, and I just used like the muscles to kind of bear through. And was that really wisdom? You know, was that really kindness? Was that really generous? Whatever you know for the mind, and to understand where we might be cultivating also un unwholesome uh, patterns towards ourselves and our practice is always important. So I think that that it's really neat to hear you say that like wanting to get to this tipping point, wanting to get to this place where it's like, I tend to frame that in terms of like bringing things to a crisis or bringing it to a head so that the, the conflict is clear. Um, to know that that is, it can be very energizing. It can be very clarifying. It can really build the concentration. And what are the things maybe that aren't getting built there is always worth looking at, right? Oh, is there also, is there still meta? Is there still compassion? Is there still mindfulness? Or are we just pushing through? Um, and, and so I think it's just, a, it's maybe something you don't need to find the answer to as much as every, every situation is different, you know, that you find it and it's like, okay, where does it feel like you're showing up with gusto for you know, something challenging? And there's a goodness in that. And then where does it feel like the energy and intensity is actually a way of not dealing with the deepest levels of it, right? Where by forcing it, we're actually not, we're being less sensitive to some truths that are important to, to see, you know? Yeah. Sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Well, seems like maybe we should end it there today. But wonderful to see you all. Hmm. And just, yeah, you know, I mean, I guess the other side is what I'll just say of, of course, the inner workings and the, the, <laughs> the ghouls and goblins in our hearts and minds and bodies. Um, you know, the other reality of, of today and of, you know, Dia de los Muertos and is like honoring of the dead, you know, honoring of, of the people in our lives who have been so important to us and who are no longer with us or no longer accessible in the sort of material way. And um, just how important that is and feel like you know, to have a little altar with some photographs or a candle, some incense, some offerings of food or sweets or, you know, whatever things that these beings might have liked. It's a very beautiful practice and it can be small. It doesn't need to be, you know, a giant affair. Um, it might be just some sort of altar in your mind, right, of, um, of honoring you know these people in our lives and 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 whose karma we are still playing out and that is still their lives are still unfolding through us in one way or another and where do we take where do we honor that take responsibility for the beautiful and sometimes more difficult ways that that's true and um spend some time you know this week and these coming days um just reflecting of course on our own mortality and on death um 
but also honoring our ancestors and our loved ones and all those who've gone before us who, you know, depending on the circumstances we're in or the circumstances that they are in, we may still feel like some ability to connect with them, you know, and, and feel a, a place of love and kindness, of um, compassion, of care and, and understanding for them, you know, and just whether you uh, adorn an outfit or a mask or not, you know, it's, the Buddha always said that, you know, love and kindness, it's, it's in our sila, our ethical conduct is our greatest adornment. You know, it's like a lay of flowers being strung that we would wear. Um, so, you know, we're always wearing some mask, we're always wearing some adornment and the sense that we have the ability to start to create that, generate that in a way um, that's wholesome and beautiful for ourselves and for the world. It's always important to remember. All right, take care everyone. Aloha, hopefully we'll see you again next week. I'm, I'm assume I won't, it'll be Steve and Michelle back on board. So um, you've had enough of me for a couple of weeks and uh, I look forward to having them back as well. <laughs> Take care y'all, aloha.